Hey y'all, so this is gonna be lecture four from week two. Uh, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about study designs and ID. So this is just going to be sort of a basic review of study designs. I think that maybe a lot of you have already had courses in epidemiology where you've gone over some of this, but I just want to get us a good base so that we have some terminology to work from throughout the term. So I am going to share my screen with you. And um, so I'm gonna keep it like this because uh, it's easier for me to um, see what slides are coming up. Um, this PowerPoint will be put online um, with the other ones, both with and without uh, myself included in them uh, so that you'll have something to look back to. So I guess um, the first question, first topic or point that we need to make is, is why do we even talk about study designs? Um, my answer to that would be that good research depends on two things. Um, first is having a well-defined research question. Um, this is the most important part of any research project is, is, is knowing what questions you're asking before the research starts. Um, I have seen so many uh, projects um, start and go just on ahead with no research question at all and, and people get to after they've, you know, the point of after they've collected data and can't answer anything because they had no research question or struggling to create one after the fact. Please do not do this. It's a very bad idea. Um, so having a defined, well-defined research question, number one. Second is having a well-defined strategy to answer that question. And this is where study design comes into play. Um, we can certainly have a question of interest. Um, we can go out and collect data, um, but if we don't have um, a strategy of how to analyze this data or, or how the data is actually going to answer our research question, then we're gonna have real trouble with our project. So today what we're going to do is a short review of different study designs commonly used in epidemiological studies. So first, uh, I wanna talk about the fundamental assumptions of epidemiology. The first major assumption is that disease does not happen by accident. Now, you know, philosophically speaking, you know, of course, you know, determinism um, is, is somewhat suspect. There's always random things that happen, but in infectious disease research, this is particularly true because disease cannot occur without infection. If that does not happen, there cannot be disease. Um, this isn't simply an assumption. Um, I think this, this, is, this is pretty much, much a fact. Now, certainly, you know, disease, you know, especially for, for a lot of pathogens can look like one disease can look like another in, in a lot of sense, but we're talking about disease specifically associated with a specific pathogen. So we assume then that disease is not randomly distributed within a population. That is to say that diseased groups and non-disease groups have predictable patterns of, 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 of risk or of incidence or prevalence or whatever. So we can use a systematic approach to study the difference in disease between these groups, infected, non-infected, uh, and, and within that we can look at male, female, uh, old, young, uh, uh, black, white, anything we think we, we want, to, want to compare. So we can also use this approach to discover causal factors of disease, what were uh, the specific uh, factors that led this person to have this disease at this time. Um, we can use the results to inform preventative measures, and that would be include interventions. Um, this is also preventative can have a broad sort of sense in preventing mortality, for example, upon being diseased. Um, but you know, for now, we're gonna talk about um, prevention in terms of preventing, preventing infection. So what we look for as epidemiologists, uh, we look at disease frequency, how often does it occur? The distribution of disease, um, who, what, where, and when. And these will uh, lead to the formulation of hypotheses so that we can find causal and preventative factors. These would be the determinants of disease. And we use statistics to statistically test for association of suspected factors which contribute to disease risk. So again, what we do is, is, as epidemiologists, is, you know, we look at 
you know, is disease occurring? If so, you know, what, who, where, when, what's going on? We all want to answer all these questions and then we want to form hypotheses from all those. <clears throat> So in epidemiology, I think as, as a lot of you probably know, there are two types of studies. Um, the first is descriptive studies, uh, and that basically allows us to generate a picture of what's out there. And these are sort of common in, in public health or government reports, you know, case reports, case studies, all these different things. And these lead to a call to action. Um, we see something occurring, um, it leads us to act, to do something about it. And part of doing something about it um, is figuring out um, what's, what's causing this, what's the story, what's the who, what's, when's, and where's. Um, and that's where analytic studies come into play. And we use these to test uh, for associations between exposures and outcomes. Um, we're testing hypotheses um, using statistics. Um, and and uh, these often, you know, these, these are really the goal of our research um, is, to, is to find out uh, the whys, you know, the whys and the hows, you know, what is, what is, where is the evidence, what is the evidence telling us, what conclusion, conclusions can we make. So descriptive studies are intended to inform us as researchers. Um, they're often the first step in epidemiological research. Um, and these types can include things like cross-sectional surveys, uh, reports generated from surveillance data, like, like your public, local public health depart department collects, the CDC, whoever, um, and case studies. Um, and often, often case studies come out of, of hospitals and clinics. Um, patients come in with something unusual. Um, case reports are written about this particular case. Um, and in, in epidemiology, we, we sometimes take those case studies and we start seeing more and more of them. And this leads us to, to ask, you know, should we go and start conducting research to find out what are the commonalities between all these cases? Analytic studies. Um, these are the type of studies are, they're meant to test for associations between exposures and outcomes um, using data and statistics. And we're using specific strategies uh, to answer specific questions of interest. And we use these studies to create targeted intervention strategies to mitigate or prevent disease. Um, today we'll be mostly talking about analytic studies. We're actually going to be talking about both. Um, but uh, when we look at ourselves as epidemiologists or as epidemiologic researchers, uh, we're mostly talking about analytic studies because we're looking for the links between exposures and outcomes. Because this is the basic question of epidemiology. Is this exposure linked to this disease. And we might expand that to say, is this exposure linked to this disease in these people, in this place, at this time? Um, this is, you know, by going back to Jon Snow. Um, he noticed uh, that there were diseased people, people, there were cholera cases out there. And he sought to discover uh, the links between exposure in this case, to contaminated water and disease, which in that case was cholera. And he demonstrated uh, this link between these two things by um, heroically turning off the Broad Street pump and thereby preventing cases of cholera in the future. So, I, you know, not to, you know, you know, you know, beat on this too much, but, you know, Jon Snow's um, um, efforts, you know, were sort of, you know, the sort of beginnings of, of epidemiology, of modern epidemiology in a lot of ways. He was looking at exposures and disease, you know, what causes disease in populations. So what do we look for? Uh, Analytic epidemiology looks for specific things. Um, first, what is the exposure? Um, we have to have some sort of speculation about what this exposure could be. Uh, who is being exposed? What is the difference between uh, the outcome, the health effects uh, between people who are exposed to this exposure of interest and who are not? Um, and also we look at dose response impacts. 
um, how does increased exposure uh, lead to increased uh, risk for disease, you know, or increased severity of disease. We often look at that too. And uh, how are, will we uncover the links between this exposure and this disease? Um, and this is where study design comes, comes in, is, is preparing our research project um, to allow us to uncover these links. So exposure, exposure question mark, disease. So we as epidemiologists are somewhat unique um, in the sciences um, because we have a prime directive, um, which is to say that, that we are tasked with protecting the public health. Um, we, are, we are tasked, we have a mission to prevent and control disease and ensure that all individuals live the healthiest lives they can. Um, to do this, we not only need to collect data, we need to approach both data collection and analysis in a manner that provides reliable answers because people's lives and, and health are depending on us um, to provide reliable and, and, and consistent answers for them. Um, and to do this, uh, we again identify a well-defined research question, have a point, right? and formally test our hypotheses using reliable methods. And this is where study design comes in. It's essential to good epidemiological research. So we're gonna go on to talk about not only analytical study designs, but, but obs observation, observational study designs as well. Um, but, but our main focus is gonna be on analytic study designs. <clears throat> so what kind of of study designs are out there. Um, as I said repeatedly, um, there's descriptive studies, uh, and these can include things like reports from government, case studies, um, surveillance reports, um, the, the information that your public health department collects, um, all different kinds of things. Um, but the point is descriptive studies just simply describe what's out there. Um, they don't do things like you know, make formal tests between exposures and, and outcomes. Analytic studies are, uh, there's more of them. Um, we have different times types. We have what's called a randomized control trial, which is an experimental study, which we'll talk about a little bit about later. Um, and there's also these other types, cohort studies, case control studies, case crossover designs, and cross-sectional studies. Um, there's, there's more than these. Um, these these were, are sort of the main ones, um, and also they fit on the PowerPoint. Um, but, you know, it should uh, tell you that, that you know, um, that analytic, analytic study designs have sort of two different flavors, design experiments, and what we call observational studies. We're going to go over all of these. So, Again, many of you have had epidemiology courses in, in the past, um, and we talk about two different types of study timeframes. Um, the first is prospective studies, where we look from the present into the future. You can follow groups of individuals over time. Uh, and then we have retrospective studies, which look from the past to the present, and studies of, study, obviously studies events that have already occurred. Um, and then, uh, you know, Perspective studies, I think, I think both of these really have to include cross-sectional studies. I think that needs to be a third category here. But in general, in, in most epidemiologic tech, epidemiology texts, you'll see these two broken out in these two different categories. So the study design sequence um, usually goes like this. Uh, this uh, uh, picture, I think demonstrates this quite well. Uh, we start with hypothesis for formation based on case reports, case series, and descriptive epidemiology. Basically, we get information about something of interest that's going on out there and decide uh, that we need to explore it further. And that leads us to, to, to develop some hypotheses, to make some speculation about what might be going on. And that leads us into hypothesis testing. We want to test our hypotheses. We want to, want to try to answer our questions, um, see if we're right or wrong. You know, is it, is our, what we're speculating valid or not? And that's where an, a, analytic epidemiology comes from, comes in, into play. 
uh, and these lead to things like clinical trials, which is an experimental uh, based design, but also cohort case control cross-sectional and case crossover designs as we saw before. Now the other component to this are animal studies and lab studies. These are primarily uh, for medical, the medical field, less for epidemiology, we do less of that. Um, epidemiology's bread and butter is, is usually on, on the cohort case control cross-sectional case crossover designs and in randomized control trials and, uh, and, and observational experimental designs. Um, we do less uh, animal testing and that kind of thing. That's, that's really for like pharmaceutical development and, and medical fields. So again, here's another illustration of how this works. Descriptive studies um, lead to, uh, for example, case control studies, cohort studies, and into designed experiments. We develop hypotheses. Case control investigates uh, the links between exposures and outcomes. Cohort studies define the outcomes meaning with exposures, um, and designed experiments test these links experimentally. Um, this is sort of a general guide. Um, obviously, you know, when when we're out in 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 the world working, uh, you know, things sort of you know the order might might be somewhat somewhat different. And sometimes designed experiments, the cohort cohort studies. Um, can lead to other questions, which lead, lead us back to doing things like case control studies. So um, this isn't, you know, quite the same as clinical trials, which has like phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase four trials, where an order has to be followed uh, to the letter. Um, this is just sort of a general guide of how this works, how the process of epidemiology works. So I think this is important. Again, you know, as epidemiologists, we are somewhat unique in the sciences in that 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 we are have a specific mission um, to protect the public health. Um, what we do uh, is intended to prevent or mitigate disease and, and allow people to live the healthiest lives they possibly can. Um, epidemiology specifically tries to build on knowledge to protect the public health. So we follow systematic steps to explore questions of public health importance. And this is part of, of our, 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 our um, requirement to have scientific integrity. Um, we have to have our results backed up by science and evidence and, and, and proper methods. Um, I can't stress how important this is. Uh, anecdotal evidence, for example, doesn't doesn't you know isn't necessarily acceptable to what we do in epidemiology. We are you know scientists. We go out and collect data. We use methods to analyze that data and draw conclusions and make statements about conclusions, you know, based on 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 what we think is what we think is true based on the evidence. Um, so we always have to have, strive to have be um, the best scientist we can. We seek to produce reliable answers while minimizing negative impacts to individuals. And this is part of ethics and accountability. Um, we're going to get into this when we start talking about the city certification, the human, human subjects training certification, um, why this is important. Uh, epidemiology and public health have a sort of checkered past uh, where we've done things that, 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 that did have negative impacts on individuals. Um, and were unethical and have brought us to the present day, you know, where, where ethics and accountability is, is, is priority one. So scientific integrity, ethics and accountability, um, really priority one. And the results uh, become the basis for interventions intended to protect the public health. And this is part of beneficence and making sure that what we do um, has beneficial impacts on, on humanity. So, you know, public health is not just about science. It's about ethics and morals and integrity and beneficence and all these things. And when we get to our human subjects training, training, um, we're really going to hammer this, hammer this, hammer at this for a while. Types of study designs. We're going to talk about different types. We've already talked about it a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about um, these different types in a little bit more detail right now. Um, with attention being paid to infectious disease, because that's what this course is about. So case reports are descriptive, uh, basically descriptive, they are descriptive studies. Uh, they're detailed presentation of a single case or handfuls of cases 
Often they come from clinics or hospitals or your local public health department. Um, something unusual uh, comes into a clinic or a hospital or is observed by public health authorities um, and uh, is unusual enough where it needs to be written up and presented in, in some kind of type of official format. Um, these are good for describing previously undescribed diseases. So for example, like when COVID-19 came out, um, people immediately, Chinese doctors immediately started reporting that uh, there were unusual cases coming into the hospital and this is worthy of some attention. Uh, they can look at unexpected links between diseases. Uh, so disease A and disease B might be happening at the same time and there might be some sort of unique impacts of this. Unexpected new therapeutic effects of, 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 of different types of new or accepted medicines, um, and also looking at adverse events. And, and also like, they can lead us to ask questions about unexpected exposures and diseases or unexpected preventative measures and diseases, you know, what's protective. So for example, uh, when the Flint water crisis happened here in Michigan, where it was found that there was lead in the water, um, reports were coming out um, that, that kids were experiencing lead poisoning. And this, of course, led people to, to look at um, potential uh, links between water-based lead exposures and, and, and lead poisoning cases. And all of this comes from the grassroots, from, from the bottom. Not to say that you know this, like your public health board, is is any less than any other part of the epidemiologic world, um, but they're really the fr the front line, and and maybe a lot of you are intending to go that route, um, which which is really great because, you know, we can't do this research without the local sort of you know so, uh, so called boots on the ground, um, paying attention and looking out for unusual unusual events. Case series, surveillance reports, uh, you see this a lot, um, especially for reportable diseases. Uh, assessment of disease prevalence, these come from your local health office. Uh, they collect data on, on incidents of, of you know, various different things. Um, there's what we call, and we're gonna talk about it in a future level lecture, like the, the, the so-called reportable diseases. Um, there's a whole list of them from the CDC um, that include things like, um, you know, brucella, for example, which isn't very common, but when a case does happen, it has to be reported to the to to the to the CDC and the NIH and and as as a disease as having happened. Data for these can come from multiple sources. Um, for some rare conditions, this is really the only way to draw attention to them. We see a rare uh, occurrence of, of some health condition at hospital A. It sort of sits in isolation, but then we start seeing it over in B and C. And it's still rare, but because it has come from different sources, it starts, we start looking at commonalities between these cases. And that might lead us to sort of ask questions of, of what, what's going on. Is this a new thing? Um, is there an outbreak going on? Um, so like I said here, a single patient with an odd presentation may be ignored, but repeated ports, reports of odd outcomes can be a, a call to action. And this is especially true with, with rare um, infectious diseases, uh, rare cancers, these kinds of things. Um, like again, you know, there's brucella is one, one example. Um, which, which I was tested for years ago after working with uh, cows and, and goats in, in, in Kenya. Um, and there's not many cases. There's maybe a couple cases in Michigan every year. Um, but, you know, if we started seeing, you know, cases here, cases there, you know, at these different facilities, then it might be reason to, to pay attention. Lyme disease is kind of another one. Um, some areas have a very low incidence of, of, of Lyme disease, but um, when you look at it over, you know, look at single facilities, you might only see one case here or there, but when you look at the entire region, you might, might that might add up and, and, and be a cause for starting to pay attention of Lyme disease as a new threat. West Nile, when it started making its expansion um, from in, in the beginning of the, the 2000s, um, there were not many cases because um, it was moving westward. Uh, that map is quite dramatic, and I'll show that to you later. Uh, but it was between 
all of this instance at individual level facilities uh, in health departments, we started drawing a picture of, of West Nile moving across the map. Case series and surveillance reports um, have advantages and that can lead us to generate good hypotheses. Um, they can identify rare outcomes. You know, at one time, you know, West Nile was, was quite rare. It still is rare, um, but it was almost non-existent on the US. Um, but as we saw more case series on this, uh, it became more apparent that it's something to pay attention to. This advantage here is that it's not useful for studying causal factors. This is, this is like where analytic epidemiology is gonna come, in, come into play. And it's difficult for assessing uh, trends over, over time because, um, it's, because we're not actively looking for these things. Um, we might be missing lots of cases. Um, and in terms of diseases like, like you know, West Nile, for example, um, where sometimes the symptoms aren't very severe, uh, people might not present to the facility, we might not know what's going on with it. So. As, as opposed to actively looking for it, um, testing people for, for it. So that brings us to analytic study designs. I'm gonna drink some water. Analytic study designs come in two flavors, observational and experimental designs. We're gonna be focusing mostly on observational studies in this course. Observational designs are intended to explore links between exposures and outcomes where evidence might be scant or not exist. These can include studies of group or individual data. And group data would include things like ecological studies where we're looking at things in aggregate, um, like for example, at the county level, um, you know, or the state level even. Uh, or we can look at individuals, which is primarily what we're gonna be interested in for this PowerPoint. Then can include cross-sectional cohort case control and case crossover designs, which we're gonna talk about right now. Observational designs are tended to explore what occurs in nature, hence the name observational. We're just looking at what's going on. Though we might explore the links between an intervention and an outcome retrospectively, these would not be experimental since no effort was made to control the parameters of the intervention so uh, this is sort of, I mean, maybe splitting hairs here, but there's you know, some sort of discussion about uh, what the real, is, is there a hard difference between observational and experimental and is looking retrospect retrospectively at, at the effects of an intervention, uh, um, you know, experimental in some case, quasi-experimental. Um, but you know, for the purpose of this course, uh, we're going to look at any, anything that's that's retrospective like this uh, will be considered observational. That's sort of splitting hairs, though. So types of observational designs. Um, there's many different kinds, which we've already seen. Um, the first we're going to talk about right now is cross-sectional designs, an observational design that tests for associations between exposures and disease status at a single point in time. Now. That, that quote single point in time designation um, is as has somewhat of a liberal de definition. It can be within a minute, a day, a month, or even a year or more. Um, <clears throat> uh, it depends. I, you know, like it's sort of you know if you can get your study done in a single day, well, great. But obviously, that's not always always the case. Uh, especially with, sur with survey, survey projects um, where people have to physically go from house to house or make telephone calls or whatever. It can take time to do your cross-sectional study. Uh, but the point is, is, is that there's no follow-up of individuals. Individuals are only measured once. That is, that's really the, the definition here of cross-sectional. Um, there's no attempt to account for a number of cases over time. Um, we're not we're interested in any sort of temporal patterns. Um, we're just looking at people measured at one, one point in time. We only have one data point on each person. Cross-sectional studies are often used to study conditions that are relatively frequent, frequent with long duration of expression. Uh, because when we're, since we're only measuring someone once, uh, we can only assess uh, prevalence of that disease. Um, either they, they have it or they don't at the time that, 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 that we surveyed them. 
Uh, we're not interested in incidents. Uh, when did they become infected? Certainly we can ask them, you know, when they might have gotten infected or some information uh, to, that, to that effect. But uh, with cross-sectional studies, we are really just looking at presence or absence of disease and in, in, in that person at that time. Um, we're mentioning chronic conditions here, but we also have to mention, you know, there's things like HIV, which is in, in essence a, a chronic health condition in now um, where people are infected and they're infected, over, infected for the rest of their lives. Uh, and, and now, of course, we have antiretrovirals, which, which, which make, 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 it, make it like a chronic condition in many, in many ways. Um, so we can measure that um, just like we would any sort of other chronic diseases. So uh, I just don't want you to get the impression that cross-sectional studies are only for chronic disease because that's not true. Uh, we often use chronic cross-sectional studies for uh, assessments of, of infections where infection is permanent, uh, number of infections you know, at a particular time point um, within a certain slice, if we can do it rapidly enough, or look at seroprevalence, um, which is uh, an assessment of past infection of, 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 of a pathogen in, in humans. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, these aren't good for studying rare or highly fatal diseases, um, simply because you're only measuring people at one particular time. Um, so if it's a rare outcome, it's gonna be difficult to catch. Uh, at that time, um, if they die before you get to their house to, to study them or call them on the phone, then, then obviously they can't be in your study either. So this is kind of a picture from Elsevier uh, of how cross-sectional studies work. You have a population, um, you have some sort of target population, you take a sample of that population, and then you look at exposed or unexposed um, and look at the different risks between those groups. And exposed or unexposed can just be your exposure of, of interest. So, you know, did people, um, you know, for example, have unprotective sex versus not ha had unprotected sex? And then, and then you look at uh, outcomes versus not outcomes. Just an example, if you were doing some sort of, of, of study on, on STIs or HIV. I think this is a good picture to look at to really get your head around um, what a cross-sectional study is. Again, we're only measuring people once. So I have spelled incidence wrong, so I'm gonna fix that. There we go, incidence, dense, yeah. <clears throat> uh, cross-sectional studies for ID, Cross-sectional studies are often used to assess seroprevalence or past incidence of disease. So seroprevalence is basically um, the presence, presence of evidence uh, that, that, that that person has been infected in the past. And so we often do this with uh, uh, malaria surveys, um, looking, looking at uh, presence of antibodies or antigens uh, to malaria uh, cross-sectionally um, to get us uh, an, an idea of, of, of how many people are, have are infected in, in a particular community or have been infected in a particular community. Uh, HIV, we can do HIV tests, for example, um, uh, and, and check for infection within, within a population uh, by, by sampling that population and then testing each individual, in, individual for uh, HIV. Uh, again, you know, back when I was in Kenya, taking blood from, from goats and cattle, we, that was a sero survey. Of, 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 of Q fever um, in, in animals, I'm looking for present evidence of, of, of past incidence of disease. Uh, these are not useful for assessing incidence of disease um, because we're not looking at time, we're only measuring individuals once. Um, poor for assessing temporal patterns of exposure uh, and not good for, again, finding out when a disease occurred um, because uh, you would have to if you sample cross-sectionally, you could, you could obviously ask people when they think we're infected, but, but obviously people often, often don't know or can't know. Which leads us to case control studies. Um, these seek to assess links between exposures and outcomes by comparing diseased persons. Persons, 
and healthy controls. Exposure data is collected retrospectively. Most feasible design where disease outcomes are rare. And they're suited to test associations between exposures and outcomes. So just to give a picture of what this looks like, um, we have a population of risk. We have controls and cases. And in, in ID terms, they can, these can be infected people um, and non-infected people. And then we, we, we ask each about their, their exposure profiles in the past. And then we compare those between, between those two groups. So obviously, you know, the, this could be subject to some level of, of, of recall biases in terms of, of exposures. Um, in some cases, um, in other cases, it might be it might be more apparent. You know, did you, you know, if we were looking at some sort of environmental exposure, you know, were you in this place at this time when this this environmental pollutant was was being <coughs> um, um, uh, introduced in the environment? You know, something something clear like that. Um, if no, you were not there, so you were not exposed to this. Uh, but it can be a lot of things. Um, it can be simply asking you, asking people, you know, if you know they they wash their hands daily or not, that kind of thing, which people are are not very good at, at recalling some in some some cases. But we'll talk more about that later. Um, but again, the the part of the <clears throat> Point is, in case control studies, we're looking at the present uh, from the past, right? We're looking at their exposure profiles in the past and looking at their infection status in the present. Case control studies, the strengths are that it's less expensive and time consuming as, as other kinds of studies, as, as cohort studies, for example. Um, they're efficient for studying rare diseases. Uh, it's in ID. It's useful for assessing the differences in exposure to pathogens between infected and non-infected groups because often we know if a person has uh, been exposed to the pathogen or not um, very clearly. Uh, limitations are that it's inappropriate when a disease outcome for a specific exposure is not known at the st start of the study. Um, in ID, this is this is less of an issue because we would test people. Uh, exposure measurements are taken after uh, disease occurrence. Um, again, we're looking retrospectively, and sometimes that can that can lead to recall bias or, you know, difficulties in recall. And I can't remember, you know, what I ate uh, three days ago, let alone two weeks, let alone a month, for example. And also, they're select subject to selection bias. Uh, um, in case of ID, uh, it's less so. Um, in others, it, it can be a little bit, it, in, in, like assessing um, different sort of clinical procedures, it can be a little bit different, but um, we're still subject to selection bias in some cases. That is that you know, cases uh, are selected um, in such a way that, that they don't, or, or controls are selected in some, such a way that they don't represent the same population um, that the cases came out of. <clears throat> Case crossover designs uh, are often used in studies of environmental exposures over time. Uh, for example, like exposure to, to pollutants, uh, air pollutants or water pollutants or whatever. Um, cases in, serve as their own controls. Uh, we're comparing the pre-disease state with the disease state over time. <clears throat> we study triggers within an individual, individual, which are good for assessing the timing of infection. Basically, like, we're measuring people repeatedly over time uh, and, and finding out uh, when uh, disease occurred uh, and then comparing their, their before and after states. Uh, case component, this is just definitions, a hazard period in which, which is the time period right before the disease or event onset. The control component is the control period which is specified time interval other than the hazard period, so before and after. So I mean, you know, especially with case crossover designs, uh, these are kind of in, in vogue right now, um, you know, especially for, for the environmental world, uh, that our, our ability to collect data uh, is, is increased right now. Um, so you know, we've got new methods of, of assessing, of, of doing studies. Uh, in the past, this was, was more difficult uh, because it was harder to collect data. Um, but now, 
now now we're much better at it. So I mean, think you, if, especially if you're into, inter, interested in environmental epidemiology, you'll see case, case crossover designs more now than the past. Cohort studies, observational, quote, uh, design comparing individuals with known risk factor exposure with others without uh, the risk factor exposure. Um, so in cohort studies, we're looking at a group of people over time and watching people move um, from the, 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 the non-disease state to the disease state, and then, then look comparing exposures between those two groups. Um, this is the best observational design. Um, it's very expensive to do and time consuming. Um, there is several cohort studies out there uh, which have been going on for, for, for decades, like the Framingham study is one example. Um, where people were enrolled decades ago into the study and watched over time and 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 surveyed uh, you know yearly or so, um, there's there's many out there. Um, they're very expensive. Grants often uh, have time limitations on there, which makes doing cohort studies kind of difficult. And also, like our careers also often have limitations as well. Um, <clears throat> so you know, yeah, kind of expensive and time consuming. Uh, data is usually collected uh, prospectively, some retrospective in some cases, but usually pro prospectively. We're looking at, 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 at groups of people over time. And here's a picture sort of demonstrating what this looks like. So initially we're looking at exposed and not exposed. So for example, you know, people drink, people in, in area A drinking water from area A and people in area B are drinking water from area B and it's known that, that the water in area A has a problem. And then we compare uh, incidence of, of disease between these two groups. <clears throat> so it takes a long time, um, very expensive, uh, but very good results. Cohort studies are good uh, because exposure status is determined before disease detection. Subjects can be selected before disease detection. detection. Uh, we can study several outcomes uh, for each exposure. The limitations are, again, it's expensive and time consuming, um, inefficient for rare diseases or diseases with long latency. And then we have problems of loss to follow up, which means that people exit, exit the survey. So, you know, again, you know, like the Framingham Health Study, Heart Study is, is one, you know, where we're looking at at groups over, over an extremely long uh, period of time. Uh, and again, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a good study, but it, it might not be big enough uh, to find our rare diseases given the cost, you know, to find rare cancers, for example, given, given the cost of following people for that long period of time. And diseases with long latency, they might have been infected before they came into the study and we wouldn't even know, so. But if you have billions of dollars, um, I, I, you know, go ahead, knock yourself out for sure. So that is, you know, leads us to experimental designs, uh, which are controlled experiments uh, designed uh, to be targeted to uncover links between exposures and disease or to test, test efficacy of a public health intervention. And these can include things like randomized control trials where uh, people are randomized into specific groups uh, where the one group is given the intervention, the other is not, and then you see what happens uh, to these. Uh, one example would be an RCT of, of insecticide-treated bed nets uh, to control, to prevent malaria. A uh, long time ago, it was, it was sort of unknown uh, whether uh, bed nets were, were going to be um, effective at preventing malaria in children. And so they, um, so one group had an RCT, you know, where they gave one group in this area, uh, bed nets in the other group in this area, no bed nets, and then, then looked at malaria incidents over time and, and definitively showed they do work under an, under an experimental scenario. Uh, experimental designs are often the final step in epidemiologic research, um, but can often generate new questions worth exploring. Um, and really always, I mean, all science generates new questions. Uh, it's, it's, I want to say it's often the final step, but not always the final step. I mean, some people sort of start out doing this, um, but, you know, 
all different sorts of things that happen. We don't have a fixed timeline, like for example, clinical trials for pharmaceuticals do in epidemiology. We, we do things that, 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 that to generate uh, insights in a way um, that minimizes risk uh, to persons. So RCTs are the gold standard of clinical research and, and, and epidemiology. Um, subjects are randomly assigned to treatment and comparison groups uh, that provide the most convincing evidence of relationship between exposure and effect. Um, not possible to use RCTs to test effects of exposures that are expected to be harmful for ethical reasons. Um, and we'll get into this when we start uh, talking about your city uh, um, certification, human subjects research certification. Um, we have epidemiology has as as a really difficult um, and, and often painful past, and and we're going to talk about that for sure. And a lot, and it has to do with infectious disease. So we'll talk about that later. So this concludes um, my lecture four, um, which which sort of combines um, four and five, or what I intend to do with four, four and five. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me um, all the time. I am here to help you. Uh, yeah. So have a good day and I will talk to you later.